Okay, welcome all to this debate about entrepreneurship for prosperity organized by the German channel Deutsche Welle and the World Economic Forum, this time in the Latin American edition from Medellin, Colombia. It is a worldwide acknowledged city for its innovation, but also because of its entrepreneurship uh, spirit. Today, with this debate, we would like to answer to one question with the help of these four panel members. And the question is how entrepreneurship could be turned into the milestone for prosperity with regards, well, to recession or economic slowing. And for that, I introduce our panel members. We start with Susan Zegel. She is the chairman and general director of America's Society, Council of the Americas. She comes from New York. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Also, we have with us Alfredo Rivera. He is the chairman of the business unit Latino Centro in the Coca-Cola company right now in Costa Rica, as I understand it, yes. We also have with us Sofia Contreras. She is a young entrepreneur from Argentina. She is the founder of Chicas in Technology, or Girls in Technology, and she also works with the leadership of entrepreneurship capital in the Ministry of Production in Argentina. And finally, we have with us also Antonio Hermirio de Moraes from Brazil. Antonio, you are co-founder of Box Capital, a small company of entrepreneurship in Brazil. Okay, we start now with the questions. And we start with Susan Zegal. Susan, I'd like to know, you are the person who knows Latin America and you have worked with Latin America for more than 30 years. How have you seen the evolution of entrepreneurship in the region? Well, I think we have to divide entrepreneurship into two categories. First one, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, it is the enterprise, the small uh, companies, the small enterprises that are, are not of self or high impact because there are several countries in Latin America that is a lot of entrepreneurship. Well, really, Latin America has is one of the regions of the whole world, one of the most, the highest ones in terms of entrepreneurship. 17% of adult population are entrepreneurs in Latin America. And then after you have to divide it into the part that has to do with entrepreneurship of high impact. And here, I think in Latin America, really, it started in Argentina, more or less in 19... Uh, 96 or 97, and uh, well, and then it had a very important evolution. Today, for example, in Latin America, there are six entrepreneurs that are worth more than one billion dollars. Those are free markets from Argentina, B, two WB in Brazil, TOTVSS in Brazil as well. All oh, those are the so-called unicorns, yes. And then uh, Despegar in Argentina, Globat in Argentina, and OLEX in Argentina. And that has created a network of an ecosystem of entrepreneurs who will really are role models for the rest of the, for Argentina, for Brazil, and for the rest of Latin America. So it is a very important evolution because the young people, uh, the same thing as being entrepreneurship, uh, says it provides hope to young people in the United States. This ecosystem here in Latin America is providing opportunities for many, many young people who would like to be entrepreneurs. How do you see it, Alfredo? Do you think you've, al uh, you've always seen the evolution that we heard just about from Susan? Yes, I think that the opportunities are indeed there. We at Coca-Cola Company, we consider ourselves as a very local company. Through Latin America, we have 2,100 employees, and we take care of 4 million customers. And that makes us like too, too local in the communities. And to be successful, we understand that our communities have to make progress. And, and we are able to contribute to that well-being in uh, those communities. And we do it via what we call the Golden Triangle, working with organizations, non-governmental NGOs, and uh, with uh, local governments. And obviously, we make alliances with them in order to promote not only training, but also to provide the opportunities to create employment. In the case of uh, Costa Rica, for example, we use 
we have a project for to generate employment via recovery of materials, recycling, generating employment for the people who need it most. Uh, have you also seen an evolution in the entrepreneurship in Latin America? Yes, but I think the success of this has to be through an alliance between uh, private uh, companies, the communities, amongst all of them, and the civilian society and the government. So I think we have enough evidence already about the impact of working this way. Not only in Costa Rica and Brazil, we have a very successful programs. So we do believe that the path to follow forward is how to bring more companies and more communities to look for these opportunities amongst the most needed communities. So if you are, you are very young, but for a long, long time you have started as an entrepreneur. Tell us how this path has been. Well, when I left the university, I started to work at a foundation that had to do with the technological entrepreneurship sector. And uh, you give the people the tools to start from zero to 100. And then I started to work in an accelerator of technology basis as an operations uh, director in Buenos Aires. This accelerating company has something very peculiar. They do not take a model copied from another country or learn from other countries. They provide a whole context of Argentina, entrepreneurs from Argentina. And that is something that we all should do in our cities and our countries. The, we are not only focused in just a great amount of projects, but our company invested only in three projects per year and doing a lot of focus and follow-up follow because I identified that the problem was not the lack of capital for these entrepreneurships to be successful, but the lack of knowledge. And as Susan said, these champions who are very important for conveying this knowledge, this accelerator company created a high-impact technological entrepreneur and is responsible right now at Cordoba City a big city in Argentina to convey this, to create and articulate the technology entrepreneurship in the city. About impact investments, Vox Capital is a company of impact investments. How does it work, Antonio? Well, I think it is important to highlight the entrepreneurship of impact, as Susan was saying, especially the impact investments. Those are the concept of investing and aiming at uh, or looking for financial return and also social deep social impact, especially and thinking in terms of Latin America, thinking that we have 200 million people who live up to, well, with only $4 per day. That's the money that they have to take an ice cream and that's it here in Medellin, for example. So we have to think on innovation to apply it to solve the big problems. So the impact investors, it is a novel concept actually, it has about four or five years old and, uh, and it is turning into a mainstream actually. It is very important as to think and how to bring technologies to solve the big problems of education, health, and even in financial inclusion as well. So Box Capital is a fund that I think, I created it uh, seven years ago and we have analyzed more than 1,500 companies for investments in 20 of them. And in those three main areas, health, financial inclusion, and education, yes. But uh, building or constituting a company in Latin America is not an easy task. I remember a report submitted by the bank, Latin American Bank of Development in Latin America to build or to constitute a company, you, you need twice as much time as what you need in any other country of the OCD. So, how to make it possible that the sectors, especially public sector, more than an obstacle to be more like an associate, a partner in constituting the company. Susan, what is your opinion? Well, I think entrepreneurs have to overcome everything. So good entrepreneurs have also overcome the problems of the government and the rules to open a company. And I think one of the reasons why the entrepreneurs are so good in Latin America is because they have a had a lot to overcome. But having said this, I think it would be much better if the governments, because all governments want to entrepreneurship, because that provides employment, hopes, and opportunities for many people. So I think it is a great opportunity. And I also think today, for example, Argentina, under the President Macri's government, and also under the different governors and the head of state of Buenos Aires, all of them are trying to simplify the opportunity to have more entrepreneurship. And I see it eventually in Brazil. 
I think it will also happen in Brazil. And you see, for example, in Mexico, the reforms made by the Mexican government, for example, in telecommunications has hugely decreased the costs for a new entrepreneur to for him to make to open an enterprise or a company because the cost of connecting internet and telecommunication has also decreased and so that has created many more opportunities for the people the entrepreneurs yes susan but likewise they continue having problems for example in terms of innovation training and also to acquire the capital what do you think we could do about it alfredo well i think and antonio was saying one of uh, the points is education and i think we and we have an example in Brazil with the, for what we do is to provide training to young people in order for them not to have an employment, but to help them to build their own business, for them to develop business uh, as simple as, for example, the use of recyclable materials to turn them into articles that are useful and that they can sell. But at the end, it is a matter of how we all can contribute and help educating a big mass of young people. And we open the door for of opportunities through education. I think that is a very important aspect on once again this golden triangle has to work and where we have to promote more this type of alliances. Sophia, for you that started so soon with entrepreneurship at the level of financing, how difficult was it to acquire capital to achieve it? Well, mainly in Argentina does not have this uh, problems, uh, industry and capital. And based on what Susan was recommended, was saying, we are working right now within the regulation framework that helps creation of entrepreneurship and in easier and more accessible investments in Argentina. But right now, but you, who started when the government had not been there, <coughs> because it's only six months there, how difficult was it? Well, those are things that continue happening right now, because right now, in order to build an, a company, you know, an enterprise in Argentina, it's not like it is in Chile or in Colombia. They already have articulated the Society for Simplified Actions. You go one day, and the next day, you can be billing and sending bills to the state. But in Argentina, the process takes from three to six months. So what happens when an uh, entrepreneurship of technological basis that need to have that legal vehicle to make investments? Yes, continue. And based on getting investments for entrepreneurship, what we've done in Argentina, uh, now not having this economic and political stability where investments from abroad do not come, what was done on one hand was to create incentives for them to invest in those that invest in traditional industries, so investors that used to invest in tiles or other industries, they were sort of like um, brainwashed to, in order for them to see the potential of investing in these uh, entrepreneurs and the champions, they were the champions in Cordoba, this ecosystem of investors is made up by Argentinians actually. Antonio, in Brazil, how many obstacles do you, does a young person that wants to invest there has to overcome? Well, there is a big progress in the entrepreneurs' ecosystem with some initiatives from the government that are interesting. Uh, most, well, I think the government has trapped, I would say, the entrepreneurs, but an innovative program, for example, the one of the Ministry of Development, well, they have trained 20,000 entrepreneurs with education, entrepreneurship, education concepts to support 600 of these entrepreneurs with mentorships and connections with the funds of venture capital, with incubators, and also uh, the investors. So uh, it is a government's initiative that I think is very interesting. And the ecosystem in the venture capital in Brazil has been developed a lot in the past 10 years with the presence of the International Inter-American Bank of Development and the FOMI, and they have invested in more than 20 different funds in Brazil. So, well, but the World Bank has said at several opportunities that they found like a relationship between entrepreneurship and the success of entrepreneurship as well as the family wealth 
So several of the entrepreneurs that are successful is because they come from wealthy families that had the means to help them to overcome obstacles and for them to make their own businesses. So do you believe that it continues to be like that or has this somehow been has changed in the past years? Susan, what's your opinion? Well, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in Argentina <coughs> came, Wences Casares. He was the first successful entrepreneur from Argentina. He had a company named Carrigan. He came from a very poor family, actually, from the southern part of Argentina. So now he is a serial entrepreneur. He's made four or five companies. They sold one after the other. And he started now, well, another eight firms. So I think there are m many, many entrepreneurs in Latin America who come from families that have the opportunity to support them. But there are several of them who do not come from these wealthy families. And if they are good, I think now the ecosystem is starting to support them. I think the problem is different. I think there is another problem. The problem is, what do you think is the problem? I think the problem is the there is a lot of money at the beginning, a lot of money at the beginning by entrepreneurship of high impact, for example, to the cycle of angel, uh, the first A round or post angel, A round, B round. There is now very little money after that and very little few opportunities because of lack of liquidity, volatility of the economy in Latin America and lack of liquidity in the capital markets. So I see it different, the problem, from a different point of view. I think the problem is the outlet, the way to go out, and the opportunity there instead of having the opportunity at the beginning. Do you see it the same way, Antonio, for what I see? Yes, it is clear. I completely agree with Susan. We started in Vox Capital, and the investment funds to be much more CBSB because of the total lack of capital. We have the venture capitals, we have the angels, and then afterwards we have private equity. Those funds uh, that are huge and more mature that are actually in the face of getting AB capital. But there is a, how could we name it? There is one thing. In Brazil we have, it's like the valley of death. We have three million reales, up to 50 million reales, it is very difficult to get capital. And it is the crucial moment for an entrepreneur to escalate up in the business. It's quite different from Silicon Valley, for example, it's or Israel. And in this case, Alfred, oh, go ahead. Well, these are actually initiatives, very good initiatives of small scale. When we speak about how do we impact in the young people, the youth that has less resources, I think there are opportunities, and uh, I've been quite interested in the global shapers. We've been supporting this program since 2012 because the programs developed there are not only, in many cases, they have impact in the communities, but also they have a high technology and knowledge components. Young people that have have a commitment to development, not only their own personal development, but the development of the communities where they live in. And these type of initiatives, Global Sherpers, are the ones who are helping us to understand, to better understand we as a company, for example, how we can help and how we can contribute. And they are of a very high impact in those communities where they are present, where these people are present, these young people. How do you see it, Sophia? I coincide with what Susan says also, but I also think that we still have a long way to go in terms of SIP. We're not having an ecosystem of developed capital investment in a country and not having the banking industry oriented towards helping to these entrepreneurs. Well, the entrepreneurs have to continue going and asking friends and families to start because, and sometimes not even that because they come with, from families with low resources. So we have to continue encouraging and creating incentives for entrepreneurs and how we can link them to the universities, schools, and gardens in order for them to put, to introduce this culture of entrepreneurs from the very beginning. Susan, in this case, what could the public sector do? Well, I think the public sector can, there are programs that the public sector could carry out in order to create incentives 
for capital uh, incomes, especially in the companies that you are mentioning now about uh, companies that are more dedicated to the community. I think the problem of high impact is a problem that has to be solved in terms of, well, for the big investments, the private sector has to solve that problem, not the public sector. And the government may facilitate the process, but a much larger role is played in the projects that affect the community and that those are entrepreneurship of social innovation and so on. And it has a much more important role than the one they are playing now. When in Argentina now, from the Secretariat of Small and Medium Enterprises, I say entrepreneurs because before we didn't have this uh, office. Now it has been created with the present government seeing the importance of it in, for our country, working in, very, in four very important areas. On one hand, the regulation framework for the creation of companies that have more easy access to it. And the capital human is to develop and to educate more entrepreneurs in Argentina, in the different provinces, making analysis of the different cities and how they can bring the national programs at the level of the provinces. The other side is infrastructure. And then the other one is investment capital. Developing the co-investment instruments where on one hand, they put co-investment for the creation, well, technological basis and scientific basis, because as Mr. Macri said before, scientific uh, research is not just a research, but we have to we have to take them to the cities and the society to generate a monetary impact and employment creation and also as something good for the society and other co-investment tools for the creation of funds also. Alfredo. Yes, if you allow me one comment about the role of the government also, there is interesting data from a report of the Global Gender Council for Latin America here from the forum that Susan and myself are members of it. And in the past 20 years, the rate of incomes in the public sector uh, has increased uh, since, um, oh, well, about from 25% up to 30%, the mean for the countries. And the social expenses as divided by the total amount of public expenses went up uh, from 50% up to 66%. So the conclusion is that the capabilities of collecting more taxes uh, uh, says that it is no longer possible to fund uh, public expenses with higher incomes of high, higher taxes. So <clears throat> this is a call for the private sector um, about social programs. So that's why impact entrepreneurship as well. Alfredo, do you agree with this, what Susan says and what Antonio says about the commitment that the private sector should have? Yes, I think they're good opportunities. And as Antonio has been doing, is uh, turning these opportunities into business opportunities. It's not just philanthropy. It is developing opportunity pathways uh, to improve development. Uh, and in the, from the point of view of entrepreneurship, this is precisely what we're all looking for. There is something else that I think the government can do in the United States. And one of the reasons why there are so many entrepreneurs uh, in uh, within the normal market, because there is a great deal of entrepreneurship uh, outside in the gray market in Latin America. But in the United States, one opens or starts a business or one closes a business in one day. And if any thing happens, if anything fails, if I have a company and it doesn't go well, I can actually close it without any cost to myself. Um, and I will not have uh, uh, problems with the um, courts or uh, uh, as, as long as I don't do anything illegal, uh, it's, it's not illegal to fail. So you can just go ahead and close your business without a problem. In Latin America, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, it is very difficult uh, to close a business here uh, because uh, uh, there is uh, a huge expenditure that will have to be incurred by the owner. There are legal consequences as well. And uh, 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 this is a, a society where it's 
hard to fail, to not be successful, and there are legal consequences to this. Uh, so one thing that the governments can do is to actually change the system so that there will be opportunities uh, for the entrepreneurs so that they can open and close businesses. And if they don't, uh, uh, if things don't go well the first time, they can try a second time or a third time. And I think uh, the government has a very important role to play in that area. Uh, can you teach somebody to become an entrepreneur? Are you born an entrepreneur? Are you born with a talent to be a businessman? Or can you learn along the way? to be an entrepreneur. I think there is a great deal of evidence that, that yes, yeah, you can develop capabilities in people so that they can be better entrepreneurs. Obviously, in uh, technology-related business, you need a certain amount of knowledge. That is obvious. Uh, but uh, if one can generate uh, the capabilities, and these capabilities can be generated, then they can start a business. Uh, and uh, uh, the knowledge they have uh, will, of course, help them to move to the next uh, financial level, they will have better opportunities for themselves and for their families, and there will be other opportunities in the area of health and education, etc. So uh, yes, you need talent, uh, but you also need uh, commitment and uh, strong hope from people so that they will be able to move through a, to a different level through training. What do you think about this? Are you born an entrepreneur? Can you learn to be an entrepreneur? I think you can teach uh, somebody to be an entrepreneur. But to take risk, you have to be a risk taker by birth. Uh, yes, I agree. But in particular, I think we can uh, uh, teach people uh, to be businessmen if we use the right incentive. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, actually uh, teach people uh, to develop applications with uh, social objectives, because especially girls are very interested in developing businesses with social objectives. They want to see a positive change in the world, because with technology, you can generate an action which will impact many people. So 13-year-old girls, for instance, are totally excited about the fact that they can create that impact, that they can actually create this good impact on the world through their knowledge and through technology. I would also like for us to talk about the gap uh, uh, in um, the uh, business area for women. Uh, I think there is a gap here for women in Latin America. But I also want to talk with you, Antonio, for you to tell me. Do you think uh, that an entrepreneur is born, or uh, can an entrepreneur become an entrepreneur along the way? Uh, I think uh, uh, that you can be taught. Uh, I, I went to Verson College, uh, college in the United States, and it focuses on uh, making people into entrepreneurs. Uh, um, uh, I, how many teach, uh, uh, professors are there teaching people how to become uh, uh, entrepreneurs. This is a science. Uh, but of course, you do need a personal profile. I agree with Susan. Uh, more than 1,500 entrepreneurs that I've interviewed uh, or that I have endorsed uh, through our fund, uh, many of them don't have uh, a risk profile. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, well, they think uh, that uh, the investor should be the one to resolve uh, their financial problems. But the idea here is to be able to use an opportunity, even if you don't have the resources for that. Uh, so uh, you know these people have to be able to take some risk and to be able to deal with adversity. I understand uh, that uh, uh, female technology, as the name expresses, is actually addressing only females. Uh, because there is a very big uh, gap uh, in terms of gender uh, with regards to technology and entrepreneurs. Uh, because ever, uh, from the time we're born, uh, we're pigeonholed uh, and we're told you're a man, you're a woman. This is the way you have to dress. This is the way you have to talk. This is the way you have to feel. And uh, uh, girls are do not see themselves uh, being engineers or being developers or being uh, uh, lawyers or whatever, uh, because there is this very strong stereotype uh, that holds them back, uh, holds our females back. So what we're doing is we're breaking stereotypes uh, precisely at that moment when females are deciding what they want to be, what they want to train in. I understand that your program also has a program which uh, helps uh, entrepreneurial women. Yes, we have one called Five by Twenty. By 2020, we want to have 5 million uh, business women around the world. Um, I work in Haiti. We have a 
development program with women. And it is not technology. It's, it's not about technology. It's agricultural. It's about uh, planting mangoes. Uh, and we realized that uh, women were much more careful in uh, growing mangoes uh, and to picking mangoes and working with mangoes than men. So. Uh, together with a different NGO, uh, we are working on mango growing and exporting to the U.S. with added value so the female um, farmers can make more money and therefore they can provide education to their families. And we also know that women are much, much more careful with uh, money so they manage it better and they're able to grow their savings and they're able to take care of them and use them in an intelligent way. So no doubt uh, this type of program will help communities to become stronger. Uh, women are vital uh, for the well-being of a community, and we can see this clearly in Haiti. Out of In a program of 25,000 farmers, more than half of them are farmers. And it is interesting to see how this uh, program has made uh, great headway. And this is a business model which is already implemented and very successfully implemented. Susan, I know that uh, you greatly defend the gap reduction in this case. What can you tell us about this? I think uh, there is a huge gap, as Sophia was saying, around the world, especially uh, in terms of technology. and. Uh, a venture capital. In venture capital, uh, there are very few women, uh, not only in Latin America, but throughout the world. And in uh, Latin America, this is even more so. And also in my country, uh, there is uh, a huge gap uh, between the amount of women uh, that are having uh, success in business or who are uh, at a senior level in uh, businesses or who are at uh, high-level positions within government. Uh, for instance, uh, we can see this in the United States and other countries. So I think that we not only need to make headway in technology, but we uh, also need to make headway not only in the business area, but we need to make headway everywhere. We need to decrease this gap. We need to open up spaces for women so that they can participate more actively in the labor force and be successful in anything they do. But what is the problem? Is the problem cultural? Yes, partly cultural, indeed. And for me, I don't think it's only a cultural problem. Yes, it's cultural. <laughs> yes, this is interesting because um, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, there is a bias test that you can uh, download uh, from the internet. And what uh, the bias test uh, tells you is the bias you have. And I work with some women on this. Uh, uh, and uh, I think through that bias test, you realize that there is a bias. And even though you insist that there isn't, uh, there is one. And in order to be able to change that, uh, you first need to realize that the bias exists. And then you need to tackle it, because this is definitely a cultural problem. And it will not change uh, unless we accept that there is a bias, that it's there. And uh, therefore, we need to make uh, certain adjustments when we are going to make decisions um, based on the fact that this bias does exist. Uh, and uh, I wasn't so sure there was only cultural. Uh, there is. Uh, 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 pizza test uh, that uh, measures uh, the performance of boys and girls in mathematics. Uh, and mostly it's boys who do better, but in Argentina it's girls who do better on the pizza test. Uh, so it's really not cultural, or it, or it is. I, I, I really don't know. Uh, so how, how can we put an end to that bias? What can we do to resolve it? Uh, where, where can we get uh, help from so that we can handle it, uh, or at least uh, so that we can reduce First of all, we need uh, to recognize that the bias is there. And then we need to acquire commitment uh, in order to promote change. And uh, the problem is uh, not only equality, but it's also a business. If your consumers are have women, then of course, your company should reflect uh, what your consumer is. Uh, uh, more than 70% of the expenditure in consumer programs are made by women. 
So if there is an organization uh, that does not reflect that reality, then uh, there's going to be a lot against you in order to be successful because you will not be incorporating that opportunity which is there. And I think this is very important. And this is an incentive that needs to change and change quickly if a company wants to be successful. We sometimes uh, do not see the mistakes that uh, can be contrarian to women. Uh, I went to an Apple store, and the first one, uh, the first step does, uh, and, uh, does not have, uh, uh, well, it has a step uh, that uh, has like a mirror so that women get on the mirror. And if they're wearing skirts, it's very uncomfortable. And uh, we also have to take into consideration uh, the economic side of things. Uh, this has a great deal to do in countries like Japan, uh, where Abby is trying uh, for women to stay within the labor for uh, Otherwise, there won't be enough people to work. Uh, so all this is a reality. Antonio, what did you want to say? I do not know what the answer is, uh, but we do need an excellent initiative, and it might come from uh, microcredit, uh, as such as Gramin Bang, uh, one of the founders, Mohamed Junior, who uh, was uh, a Nobel Prize winner, has more than 7 million of micro-entrepreneurs, and 90% of them are women. And to give you an example, in Latin America, we have Compartamos, or Let's Share, which was an initial investment done by the World Bank. And the return, financial return rate was more than 100% per year during, during seven years until they did the IPO in 2007. But today, it has 2 million micro-entrepreneurs, and more than 90% of them are women. So the economic opportunity of including women uh, uh, is very interesting, and we must give them access uh, to these opportunities. Now we're going to open up a space for questions and answers. Please give us your name. Tell us whom you're addressing your question to. If you can be as brief as possible, we would appreciate it so that more people have the opportunity to participate. Uh, we have a question right here. I want to talk about females or gender. I am Elona from Garate Institute in Brazil. Uh, this uh, issue with women goes beyond cultural uh, problems. Uh, when we think about uh, businesses, uh, well, sometimes these businesses are not prepared to uh, receive uh, women uh, who have children and need more flexible schedules. Uh, so in the business world, we need to create uh, different rules. Uh, we need to be able to raise our kids up, and all, we also need uh, a space to be successful. Uh, but I think w women are penalized nowadays. It's not easy. There, uh, you, you do pay a price for being a woman in your career. What do you think about this? Uh, what, in, in, From the business perspective, what do you think about this price that women have to pay throughout their career because of being women. I think that we always need to open up new spaces where women can be mothers and also have their businesses or their work. I do know women that, well, if they have their own uh, business, they can take their kids to the company, and there would be a lot of flexibility in that way. You would need to create that flexibility because uh, these are very personal decisions. Um, but I agree. Uh, you need to create spaces uh, in order to be able to raise your children and work. Uh, this is uh, you need to strike a balance, uh, and for this uh, you need the support of uh, the father as well, the husband. Uh, because in a world uh, where the mother and uh, uh, the mother work. Uh, this changes the balances in the the balance in the household. Uh, they both need uh, to be more responsible or participate more actively in, in child raising. Uh, there are many societies where, uh, when couples marry, the woman has to stay home. There she cannot go out and work. And this is the cultural part that I'm talking about. 
I'm going to answer from the point of view of the impact on the investor. There is a rating with five main criteria. One of the criteria is governance, uh, social impact, environmental impact of uh, the product, uh, the uh, focus on the business model. And the fifth one is uh, the relationship with the labor force. Uh, the labor task. And one of the components is uh, gender inclusion. This is just to tell you that uh, since we are impact investors, we are 300, we represent 370 impact funds in the world. Well, I, I, I have to tell you that uh, many of these funds are using this rating system, which means uh, that you're assessing the situation and you're looking to incentivate uh, these forms of impact. Uh, in our fund, 50% uh, of the success rate of the fund is related uh, to this uh, impact rating which includes the fact that uh, that we need to change financial incentives. Uh, another question. My name is Adriana Sarmiento, and my question is, uh, it has to do with financial inclusion of micro enterprises. From what I've heard from you and the knowledge that I have, I see that there's a great gap uh, between a micro uh, a company and a small or medium company. We see that different countries have credit systems and we see that different countries have different loan systems that allow for development. But when we go to micro companies, we see that they are restricted to microcredit, which is a sort of philanthropy in my concept. I think this is the first step, but we have to get over that first step quickly. Micro businesses must not be about philanthropy. Entropy. It must be an economic system that would include them as prosperous economic businesses that will contribute to the progress of countries. What can we do in this regard? We'll create a cultural and financial change. So from the top down, we have to show the world that there has to be a credit system in order to measure the risk of micro companies as such so they can be included within a uh, financial system, and they should be rated in that financial system like any other company. I I think I understand her point. I will give you an example with my company. Within uh, the value chain, we want to determine how far these companies can go and how can they become suppliers of another company. And with that, with a contract, once they get it, they can have access to credits. And I think within the value chain, there would be opportunities to be able to give opportunities uh, to this uh, kind of micro company or small company. But I think uh, uh, what the company needs is to be sure that they will have a source of income. And if they have a source of income, uh, then they can have access to credit. Yes, of course, I agree with that. Uh, I think we have to find a way to look for financing. And in order to do that, the bank uh, needs to be sure that there is going to be income uh, to pay the loan. Uh, something else which I think is very important is that we need more institutions in Latin America to work on microcredit. Uh, they need to develop the banking system. They need to develop it much more here in Latin America because uh, there are countries that have almost nothing, including Argentina. Their uh, banking system uh, needs to be developed uh, much more, and I think other countries need to develop that system as well. Uh, and, and this is uh, where the startups uh, come up, uh, which are linked uh, uh, to microcredits, and they are being sort of overseen by the microcredit system. Uh, two more questions over there. Good afternoon. My name is Camilo Ruiz from Global Shaper in Medellin, and I have a company that promotes uh, entrepreneurship and social investment. Uh, two questions. The first one goes to Susan, and the second one goes to Antonio. The first one is, uh, personally, I am a little tired uh, from hearing about innovation ecosystems. Uh, this is mostly about a lot of institutions that do not work in an integrated manner. 
but there is one system uh, which is uh, working, and if there is one, I would like to know what it is. Uh, and uh, before talking about entrepreneurship uh, for prosperity, we should talk about uh, businesses with a purpose, because some people only think about business in order to get money or to uh, create jobs, uh, but uh, there is no real uh, why? Why are we creating a business? I think this is uh, something which needs to move beyond just uh, income and jobs. Uh, I think uh, in Argentina we have a good example because we have many uh, successful uh, entrepreneurs like Marcos Galparin or uh, the people from Globant. Uh, they are investing. It's, and some of the founders already have started other funds, and there is an entrepreneurial ecosystem helping other another eight entrepreneurs. And Endeavor is also very well developed in Argentina. So I think uh, that uh, the system is definitely working there. And the last point I want to make is that Endeavor has carried out a study uh, which uh, um, has uh, done a uh, mapping of the ecosystems in certain countries. And this is very interesting uh, because there you can see the multiple effect uh, of the ecosystem and how uh, how to create uh, one, the fact of having one successful entrepreneur will multiply the number of entrepreneurs that will come out of that. Uh, I like that question very much because I think uh, the businesses of the 21st uh, century will be uh, businesses with a specific purpose on uh, in mind. Uh, the millennials are totally involved with this purpose. Uh, it's not only about just the business and the money and the jobs, but about the purpose of the bill. Uh, of the business. Uh, we need to learn how to resolve uh, big and small problems. Uh, talent. Talent has a, has a specific uh, purpose. Uh, uh, we uh, have to uh, we, we need to learn to attract talent, to retain talent, uh, uh, to spot talent. Uh, for instance, uh, Carlos Slim, uh, his investment thesis is uh, uh, where are wherever the biggest problems lie, there also you'll find the biggest opportunities. Uh, this is a great opportunity for change. 66% uh, of millennials, according to Deloitte, uh, think that the main uh, purpose of a business is uh, to have some kind of positive uh, impact. Uh, and 44% think that the purpose of a business is to add value uh, for the shareholder. So there is a cultural change that is taking place in this new generation. Uh, we have one more question over there. Could you please uh, stand up so that the camera can uh, focus on you? My name is Berta Bayer, a global shaper from Managua Hoppa. And um, uh, talking about ecosystems, I would like to ask you what are your recommendations and what your experience has been in order to be able to take uh, these uh, successful ecosystems, as is the case in Argentina, which uh, Susana was mentioning. How can we take these successful ecosystems to other countries that have not been so successful? We're talking about um, entrepreneurship uh, and companies such as mine, which is uh, developing a com economy and the resources are scarce, et cetera, et cetera. For me, in particular, the commitment by institutions is absolutely fundamental within uh, the uh, ecosystem, uh, the government, uh, the investors, uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, uh, the venture capitalists. Uh, they have to uh, have a real commitment. They should generate a system in which uh, uh, they will be meeting regularly, and rather than stepping on each other's toys, uh, toes, they will be looking to potentiate uh, their possibilities uh, by working together. So these entrepreneurs uh, should adopt this commitment, and they should be the leaders in the generation of this new system. We have another question. Could you please uh, stand up and tell us what your question is? And 
Carmen Gisela Vergara uh, from uh, the Economic Integration Secretariat in Central America. Central America has a regional policy for the equality of gender. And within this policy, we have developed a regional program to promote uh, the economic autonomy of women. But we still have many cultural gaps, uh, more than legal gaps, uh, so that women can have access to financing through non-written practices, uh, but uh, they take place every day in credit institutions. To resolve that problem, uh, we have created a financial product uh, according to gender. This will be launched in about one month in the President's Summit. Uh, and uh, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, has faith in the program and has financed the program, but it's important for women to also have somebody to work with them. It's not only about having access uh, to loans, but to also have technical and practical aid uh, so that they can become part of the national and international uh, uh, value chain. So my question is the following. In your knowledge, uh, are there any support programs uh, that we could look into so that we could uh, use them uh, in this, developing this initiative, in the development of this initiative? Alfredo, I, I, if I understood correctly, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm presuming this is uh, this is what you said. Uh, how are we dealing with this? Uh, how are you communicating this to women? Uh, the financial product. Uh, uh, will uh, uh, be a second tier bank, and the second one will be in, uh, will be used as well. But what uh, can we do so that these women ha will have like a support for their program, whatever it will be, a service? It's not enough to just have the idea. But uh, how do I turn this into uh, a reality? We don't have incub incubators. Uh, we have uh, no other types of mechanisms. What type of programs uh, can you propose uh, so that we could use them in order to complement uh, the financial resource? I think this is something which is very important, which you have mentioned. And I think we need to incorporate and have clear objectives so that we can include women or female uh, companies within the production value chain, because this would be the only way in which we, uh, we could give support to these companies. And I think uh, that uh, the companies themselves uh, need to uh, think about uh, their own social commitments in ways to support their commun community so that they can include more female uh, companies within the chain. I'm sorry, but uh, she's not using the microphone. We have another question over here. I would like to talk about reality and failure. I think uh, the history of business entrepreneurs, when they fail, they should not be stigmatized. Uh, they go to the market and they show scars. Uh, what happens in Latin America? We're still stigmatizing people who fail. This is what I was saying before. This is a very serious problem, and it exists. Uh, 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 people think that if they fail and if they're not successful, then it's all over. It's life is over. And uh, uh, then you have to just work for somebody. But this doesn't happen in the United States. I think this is changing. Changing The stigma is, uh, is, is tending to disappear. I think the laws and the governments uh, need to change the legal environment uh, so that uh, there will be no liability that will perpetuate uh, uh, the myth of a failure or the situation of a failure, because it's really not a myth. It's a, actually a circumstance. Uh, we have two more questions here. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Pablo Jackson, Jackson uh, and uh, I come from Costa Rica. Uh, my company is called uh, Young People in Action. I worked uh, in Endeavor for some time, uh, and we used to see these role models with a purpose. Uh, and the purpose is not only about financial uh, success. And they, these uh, successful people should be able to become new mentors, which is something that is already happening in Argentina. I want to ask two concrete uh, questions. Uh, uh, I think I've seen efforts uh, to support uh, females, uh, give them technology, but how do we improve the situation of those people that work with them as well? Are they are significant others, their parents, their children? Sometimes we're talking uh, 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 about different possibilities such as a venture capital, but still there are many systematic uh, biases, even in the most sophisticated, innovative businesses. So my concrete question right now is what can we do to support this and to redefine uh, the masculinity factor of those people that are working with these women and who are empowering those women in order to get uh, uh, more education and technology? For me, this has to do uh, with a better education, with a better gender perspective, better family education. I think many companies at this moment are also providing different uh, programs within their organization so that people that work there will take this into consideration. They will think more deeply about uh, how are they educating their children, what kind of language are they using at home, and how they're working within their companies, what kind of things they can do to improve their situation for the female gender. Uh, Well, I'm Luz Mary Guerrero. I come from the presidency of Servi Entrega Delivery Company, a leader in the Andean region in logistics. We are in Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, Peru, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and we have strong a lot. We have worked a lot in entrepreneurial development, and we are very much encouraged by the World Economic Forum in Panama. And we have been managing formal employment. We are one of the fastest growing organizations in uh, formal employment, but also franchises for services. We have 12,000 solution centers in the Andean region, and it is a matter of incorporating franchise models for services. And also, maybe, Segal, would you share with us how our franchises uh, being valued or assessed in Latin America, and how much progress has the forum made in order to make it more flexible? The uh, labor subjects for new entrepreneurs? Well, the truth is that the franchise as a model, we have many customers that are franchises, is successful. There are, of course, investment requirements behind that. And if the first step is to obtain resources and they are not available, how to make uh, that opportunity possible for the people to open that opportunity? So I think depending upon at what point in time or what is the objective of the people who want to get the franchise, what support could you provide if it is financial or not. It is a model that can help. I had, uh, well, regarding franchises, I stayed thinking uh, the process that you follow in Argentina is something, does it travel, does it go around, may it travel around and help others? It in the processes like as to build a, an initiative of technology, for example, or any other type. Uh, those are the steps that have to be followed in order to do these models, are there, can you replicate them? Well, it depends upon what company. Some companies demand certain technologies or the software development, but each one changes depending upon the field in which they are because well, it could be expanded and could be more inclusive. Yes, the technology basis companies are replicable because that is the attractive thing of this uh, software. And one of the most successful companies in Latin America is not only in one country. Those are from they're at regional level, not just country level. So they are you can replicate them because uh, throughout the countries in that sense. 
The question is, what is the cost of replicating it if that opens opportunities for other people? Well, we just have time for just one more question. Please be brief. Your name and the brief question, because it's only one more minute uh, that we have left to conclude this debate. I am Andres Escobar. I'm Global Shaper from El Salvador. And the brief question is, we've talked about funding, we've talked about creation of companies, but I would like to know, talking about social impact, what are the best practices that maybe Antonio and Surar have seen for measuring the impact? How do we know that these companies are working? Well, very briefly, uh, this is the rating system that I've mentioned before. The name of the system is GEARS, G -E a R S, which is Global Impacting uh, Basic Rating System. It was developed by B-Lab company with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation with Deloitte and others. Basically, it is uh, like an audit activity that throughout the whole year with all the companies of the portfolio of an impact investment fund. I mentioned the five perspectives that I've uh, well, I mentioned before, the benchmarking today for impact assessment in investment funds, impact investment funds. Well, with this, we conclude this debate about entrepreneurship for prosperity. Thank you all for coming, for being here in this debate of the Deutsche Welle, where we can conclude that indeed there is an entrepreneurship potential in Latin America, but we still have a long way to go. We need money, we need innovation, and also we need more support to women, so thank you all for coming and enjoy this journey at the World Economic Forum in Medellin. Thank you.